Algeria is more than just my country, because I've lived here all my life. It's the people. It's our people. We really love this country. We agreed amongst us that we were not going to leave those we loved. Whatever came our way, we were going to stay. We had already given our life. They could not take that from us. We had already given it to God. So we said, no, we will remain faithful. We never thought that those in religious communities would be affected. We didn't feel foreigners in this country because we served the underprivileged and we took part in their humble lives. Being the largest country in Africa, the Arab world, and the Mediterranean basin all at the same time, Algeria has always been a source of fascination for mystics, writers, and explorers. Homeland of St. Augustine in the 5th century, Muslim in the 8th century, and colonized by France in 1830. Those who chose to live there, like Charles de Foucault, who called himself the Universal Brother and lived in the heart of the Sahara Desert, loved the country deeply. Independence in 1962 marked the end of French Algeria. At that time, a million people of European origin, the so-called Pieds Noirs, or Black Feet, many Catholic, left the country. This exodus represented a real turning point for the church, which had to re-examine how it should maintain its presence in the country. Post-colonial Algeria underwent considerable changes, and the church experienced a period of complete destitution, with almost all the believers leaving the country. Cardinal Duval's intuition was that the church should indeed remain in Algeria, but that it should become a church for Algerians. Yet, many of the congregations that had existed in Algeria were suddenly deprived of their missions working in education and health. They therefore had to reinvent a way of being present among the Algerian population. But what was remarkable is that the independence of Algeria coincided with the Second Vatican Council. And because of this coincidence, the church had already prepared documents for establishing interreligious relations. And even today, these documents are still used to foster relations. I think that since independence, the Algerian church decided to be a church for meeting others, a church for making friendships, and a church for the Algerian people. And I think that thanks to the organization known as the CCU and other organizations of the church, we have welcomed the rather unique way the church is run here. The church serves the population, children, women, professionals, working persons, and students, but it also serves the people of the country who are mostly Muslim, not Christian. During the 1990s, a period of violence broke out in Algeria. The Islamists, who had reached the corridors of power, clashed with the army and carried out more and more targeted attacks against civilians. The armed Islamic group, GIA, threatened to kill all foreigners who had not left the country by December 1993.
On December 14th, 12 Croatian and Bosnian technicians were killed in Tamaskida, a few miles from the Tiberin Monastery. On May 8th, 1994, in the Ben Cheneb Library in the heart of the Kasbah, the first two members of the Catholic orders were murdered. Brother Henry Verges, a Marist, and Sister Paul Helen St. Raymond, a little sister of the Assumption. I must admit that I was totally stunned. I could not believe it because she had been in Algeria for more than 20 years. She was fully integrated, she talked to people, she knew everyone. When I went there and I mentioned Paul Hélène's name, immediately people opened their doors. For me, an assassination was unthinkable. We felt totally destroyed and discouraged by this attack. Yeah, it happened on a Sunday. And that Sunday, the Gospel reading said, there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for those one loves. They were buried the following Thursday. And once again, we heard the same gospel reading. So we thought, this is a message we should listen to. What personally touched me was, at the time of the burial, at Notre Dame d'Afrique, we were all at peace. We didn't feel any hatred. And some people commented, how can this be that you are at peace? Well, yes, we were at peace, because I believe we were living out what needed to be lived out. That is, we needed to be there, close, continue our work, and not allow ourselves to be affected by the anxiety in the air, even if we were somewhat worried. But we were more worried about our neighbors. All the religious congregations were faced with the choice, leave or stay. For example, in one community, three Spanish Augustinian sisters, Sister Lourdes, Sister Caridad, and Sister Esther, spent some time in discernment. On October 6th and 7th, 1994, they met with their superior general in their provincial in the presence of Bishop Tessier. They discussed whether they should leave the country or change neighborhoods. We met at the diocesan house to reflect with God and with the Word of God. We asked ourselves many questions. We each expressed our reasons for wanting to leave the country or for wanting to stay. And at the end of the two days, we made the definite decision that we wanted to stay in the country. They unanimously declared, this is the neighborhood where we are known, this is where our sign of faithfulness can be understood. We are staying where we are. Twenty-third of October, Mission Sunday. The sisters were going to Mass in the evening in the district of Bab el Uwed, where they were living. They chose to listen to the advice of their embassy, which was to avoid walking altogether. Esther and Caridad left first. Lourdes and the provincial, Maria Jesus, followed them at a distance of 100 yards. The first two were murdered at the door of the church by a gunman who fled the scene. There was a series of violent acts. On the evening of the murder of the Augustinian sisters, I went to see an Algerian family whose husband had been murdered. In other words, the circumstances were affecting everyone, not only us. All the Algerians were experiencing similar difficulties, including the officials, the teachers, all the members of the civil service, the hairdressers, the artists, and the journalists. Consequently, what we were experiencing was just the same as the rest of Algerian society. We were coping until, by the grace of God, the extremists would end this violence.
The dark decade resulted in more than 150,000 victims, including 114 imams who lost their lives for refusing to justify the violence. Between 1994 and 1996, 19 Catholic monks and nuns from eight different congregations were murdered in Algeria. All of them had chosen to stay amidst the hardship. Fulfilling the words of Jesus, there is no greater love than to give one's life for those you love. The church chose to beatify them, that is, declare them blessed. A beatification is a model of a life offered by the Church to the Christians of the entire world. It is a model of a life lived following Jesus, and in this particular case, it is the model of a life offered up completely as a sign of the deep brotherhood between Christians and Muslims, and, more simply, between humans. And it is a beautiful thing that this model can be put forward by the Church in today's world. It is therefore a gift of grace for the community and for the whole church. They are a sign for the entire church that our vocation, as a church, gives meaning to their life. They gave their life to God, but they had given it to these people. The very identity of our church is giving its life to God and to the people of Algeria, a country where it has been established since St. Augustine. For 150 years, the White Fathers, the priests from the Society of Missionaries of Africa, shared the daily life of the Algerian people. They were mostly active in education, discreetly bearing witness to the gospel. In Tizi Uzu, in Kabili, a small community of missionary priests was not spared from the violence. On December 27, 1994, Christian Chessel, Jean Chevalard, Charles Deckers, and Alan Girlengard were killed in the courtyard of their house. More than 4,000 Muslims attended their burial and paid tribute to them. It is a great blessing for me to be in a parish that experienced the martyrdom of four priests. When you know that you're in a place where people gave their lives out of the love for Christ, it gives life and strengthens your spiritual life. It makes you think that if they loved God until the end, why not me too? For me, living in a community that was the home of people who were subsequently beatified is already a great joy, and I think it's a sign of God's love. It really shows how we need to strive to follow God's will. These people, with what they were given, were in their everyday life true disciples of Jesus. If we're looking for people who reflect the image of Christ, we can see it in these priests. They lived without fanfare, without grandstanding, without searching to be heroes. They lived from day to day with what they had, and rather modestly. What was important to me, and what was important to them, was to keep on doing good. Helping the poor, giving something to others, they deprived themselves for other people. They were never worried about the little stuff. They always defended the weakest amongst us. Even today, population shows great trust in the white fathers who are present in Tizi Uzu. The fathers tutor students and help in the library, a project that Father Christian began but that he wasn't able to complete. The library specializes in five areas, 
Medicine, pharmacy, biology, English, and the language of Berber or Tamazight, spoken in Kabylie. Alors, ça représente vraiment. So it really represents something wonderful for young students who are often a bit desperate and want to leave Algeria when they come here. It's not just intellectual work they do here. We accompany them in their social life and sometimes their cultural life and even sometimes in their prayer life to help them cope intellectually and morally so they can flourish in life. The library allows any student to come and borrow books that are usually very expensive, especially medical books, books they couldn't afford to buy. And in the end, uh, to just find this here is very important. The next attack was on two nuns from the Order of Our Lady of the Apostles, who were murdered on September the 3rd as they were leaving Mass. They were on their way back to the municipal centre, where they had the mission to teach young girls of the area. They were murdered a few metres from their house. And imagine this as a kind of sign that they were fully integrated in the neighbourhood. A few weeks before, the people from the neighbourhood sports club came, stopped under their window, and chanted, the sisters with us, the sisters with us. They had been there since 1965. They were killed in 1995. A few weeks after the assassination of Sister Bibian and Sister Angel Marie, two other nuns were attacked at the door of their home. On November 10th in Aprival, a populous district of Cuba, a suburb of Algiers. The two little sisters of the Sacred Heart of Charles de Foucault were targeted as they went to mass. Sister Odette died, and Sister Chantal, hit by two bullets, was seriously injured. Sister Chantal recalls precisely the moment when her eyes met those of her attacker. At the very moment when this boy and I looked into each other's eyes, I remember I said to myself, thank you, God, that I do not know him. Because I, I think it would have been very difficult if he had been one of our neighbors because I would have thought, I'm the target here. In this situation, I said to myself, I don't know him, he does not know me either. He's targeted someone French, European, Christian, but it's not me. So, in fact, I always had the feeling he had hurt himself more than he had hurt me. And it's true, quite often I prayed for him, because I don't know how this man got on. Because finally, I got well but I'm not sure about him. The Eucharist had a central place in the life of these 19 people. Among them, five sisters were killed on their way to or from Mass. Sir Odette Prévost when Sister Odette Prévost evaluated the situation with the two sisters from the community in which she lived, she took strength in the Eucharist to discern she said, I am here because Christ said, do this in memory of me. So my presence in Algeria is a Eucharistic presence. 
Je pense que par, pour nous, les, les chrétiens, I think that for us Christians, la the Eucharist is the center of our lives. So that's what held us and kept us together, kept us strong. That's where we received the body of Christ, and that is where we came to share the sufferings of all the people. We really came to give what we had experienced. And I think that throughout the day, we were blessed with this grace, and we were in prayer. We were all prepared to give our life and to share with Jesus Christ this gift and this offering to God in communion with all Christians and also with all our Muslim brothers who were suffering. At Tiburin, in the heart of the Atlas Mountains, the Cistercian Trappist monks live in harmony with the people of the village next to the monastery. They have been there since 1938, seekers of God and men of prayer in the midst of believers in the one God. Christian de Cherge, who arrived at the monastery in 1971 and who became the prior in 1984, gave a new impulse to the intellectual and spiritual relationship with the Muslims. He founded the group Ribat es Salam, meaning the link of peace, with several other consecrated Christians. They were soon joined by the members of a Sufi brotherhood, a spiritual movement in Islam, and who came from a nearby city of Medea. The meetings took place at the monastery of Tiburin. Two other monks, Christophe and Michel, joined the Ribat, as did Brother Henry Virgis, Sister Odette Prevost, and Father Crystal Chassel. Gradually, a unique path of prayer and sharing blossomed between the Christians and the Sufis. The Sufis quickly proposed something. They said, we will talk together, we will exchange ideas, but we will avoid talking about theology. Because theology, and I'm using their terms, can be divisive. But we can talk about the path that we are taking towards God, both you and us. Well, that is spirituality. And then a second thing they asked us rather quickly, we can pray together, not us on our side and you on your side, but we will pray together. Well, you know, we cannot pray together all the while keeping our respective prayers. We cannot experience their prayer with them, except for a few elements, because there is theology in prayer. We will pray in silence, I thought. That's what is needed. It's truly monastic. I think that the future of our church includes encounters between different spiritualities. We need a spiritual church, living with the breath of God, with the inner spirit, and searching to meet different spiritualities. And really, this is what interreligious dialogue is. It's a dialogue of life, a dialogue of humanity. It is similar to the way the saints lived, meeting one another, and the encounter becomes spiritual. And when meeting one another, we experience awe, wonder, and gratefulness. On March 25th, 1996, the Christian members of Ribat came together again at the monastery of Tiburin for three days of meetings. During the night of the 26th to the 27th of March, seven monks, Christian, Christoph, Luke, Bruno, Michel, Paul, and Celestin were kidnapped, with only Father Amade and Father John Pierre being spared. On May 23rd, their death was officially announced.
Monsignor Pierre Clavery, a Dominican and the Bishop of Oran, was born in Algiers in 1938. He was a scholar and a man of prayer. He was attentive to the needs of the population and understood well Algeria's political and social life. In this whole crisis, the person who spoke up in the clearest and most powerful manner about the church's motivation was Pierre Clavery. Again, in a clear and powerful way, he also pointed out the violence of the Islamists and the excuses that many people in the Algerian society made when they were faced with this violence. He was a brother to us. He was a father and a guide. To us, he was not a Christian. He was first and foremost a man. He taught us how to live together. It is not only the Christians who have lost a man, it is also the Muslims. It's the Muslims who have lost this gentleman. On August 1st, 1996, Pierre Clavery was killed by a bomb explosion as he returned to his bishopric, along with Mohamed Bouchiki, a young Algerian who had just picked him up at the airport. On December 8, 2018, the beatifications of the 19 religious men and women who died between 1994 and 1996 took place at the Santa Cruz Basilica in Oran. I think choosing Oran seemed quite natural to us. Obviously, because he gave his name to the cause that of Bishop Pierre Clavery and his 18 companions, martyrs, but also because he died here, in this place, in this bishopric. His blood mingled with a young Muslim, Mohamed Bouchiri. And what is very beautiful in this story is that Pierre Clavery, a few months before his death, when seeing Mohammed go past, said to a priest, you see, it's worth staying for a single boy like Mohammed. It turned out that when they both died, with their blood mixed together, only a few meters from here, we found in Mohammed's possessions an extraordinary spiritual testament for a boy of just 20, 22. And suddenly this testament told us that Mohammed had also remained at the cost of his life with Pierre Clavery, and not simply the reverse. So in this sign of mixed blood, there is a kind of reciprocity that says a lot about the witness of these 19 people. For us Christians, it's profound to think that a young Muslim was also ready to give his life for a Christian bishop. They were not heroes, they were ordinary people, and it is to this ordinary holiness that we are called every day. I love what the Holy Father calls in his exhortation, the holiness of our next-door neighbours. That is to say, to be able to see holiness in the face and in the life of another person. I believe that this is the life of our church. Our 19 brothers and sisters know how to see holiness in the people they meet, the people they had relationships with, and the men and women living near them. In those people they saw the face of God, the face of the Christ, and gave thanks for their lives. Le jour de demain est à Dieu. Il ne t'a 
t'appartient pas Ne porte pas sur demain les soucis D'aujourd'hui Charge des regrets d'hier, de l'inquiétude de demain, la passerelle celle des super pieds. L'avenir, Dieu le donne. 